will break up soon and I will kill more. Number one, Tevin Biles Thomas. Tevin Biles Thomas, the brother of Olympic gymnastics champion Simone Biles, has been acquitted of murder charges. Tevin Biles Thomas was initially charged with the fatal shooting of three people at a New Year's Eve party in Cleveland in 2018. The first trial came to an abrupt end when jurors mistakenly saw legal briefs among the trial evidence reflecting a debate between prosecutors and the defense about whether Tevin had acted in self-defense. After the second trial concluded, the mother of one of the victims appeared visibly upset and charged towards Tevin Biles Thomas, creating chaos in the courtroom. His defense lawyer, Joseph Patacucci, expressed that Tevin felt vindicated by the acquittal and that he had a promising future, possibly in the army. Simone Biles, a five-time Olympic medalist, has not commented on the acquittal. Tevin Biles Thomas was arrested in August 2019 and charged with murder, homicide, voluntary manslaughter, felonious assault, and perjury in connection with the 2018 shooting that took the lives of three individuals at a house party. Simone Biles, in response to her brother's arrest in 2019, expressed difficulty in processing the situation and requested privacy for her family. Number two, Jaleel Smith Riley. Defendants serve a term of life without parole. As to count four, for the offense of attempted murder, violation. This reaction from a confessed killer was the last in a series of intense moments in this Hamilton County courtroom. On November 16, 2013, Riley was a participant in a heinous armed robbery in Norwood, Ohio. Accompanied by two other individuals, they approached a parked car occupied by 20-year-old Portia Brooks and her boyfriend Aaron Martin Smith. In a terrifying confrontation, Riley knocked on a car window, brandishing a handgun, and compelled Martin, who was in the passenger seat, to exit the vehicle. Subsequently, one of the assailants, Jaleel, rifled through Aaron's pockets, demanding his money. Tragically, after robbing Aaron of all his cash, Jaleel callously tried to end his life with a gunshot to the head, leaving him with permanent brain damage. The horror didn't end there. Immediately after shooting Aaron, Jaleel leaned into the car and fired two more shots at Brooks, who was still sitting in the vehicle. She tragically succumbed to her injuries three days later. Fortunately, Aaron survived the ordeal, albeit with severe injuries. But he killed me mentally, emotionally. He killed my identity as a mother of three, as a family of four. Prior to the judge's announcement of Jaleel's sentence, Portia's grieving family had the opportunity to address the jury. Sharon Brooks, Portia's mother, brought a box containing her daughter's ashes to the courtroom, as she had for previous court appearances. She expressed how Smith Riley had shattered her life and the identity of a mother of three, leaving her with nothing but the painful reality that her daughter was gone. He wants parole? Well, I want my sister. Let's trade me. Tia Marie Brooks, Portia's sister, emotionally pleaded for the maximum sentence for Smith Riley, believing that life without parole was the appropriate punishment. Then, remarkably, Aaron, the survivor of the gunshot to the head, addressed the court, declaring that Portia would always be with them as their guardian angel, helping them through difficult times. Since had a change of heart, would like to withdraw his guilty plea. Four defendants serve a term of life without parole. As to count four, for the offense of attempted murder violation. This reaction from a confessed killer was the last in a series of intense moments in this Hamilton County courtroom. If Smith Riley's crime wasn't already horrifying, his reaction to the sentencing was even more dramatic. Initially, on August 11th, 2021, Smith Riley had pleaded guilty to aggravated murder and attempted murder. However, he later, against his attorney's advice, decided to withdraw his guilty plea. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go back on my I'm so sorry. This is what I'm coming up with.
This unexpected move shocked both the victim's families and his legal team as it reinstated the possibility of the death penalty. In the midst of the trial, Smith Riley made a last-ditch effort to show remorse, apologizing in court. Nevertheless, Judge Charles Kavicki, presiding over the case in Hamilton County Common Pleas Court, rejected Smith Riley's plea and handed down a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. The 23-year-old criminal collapsed to the courtroom floor upon hearing his sentence. In addition to the life sentence, Smith Riley also received an 11-year sentence for a related attempted murder charge. Number 3. Esteban Carpio oh so rarely does one story. So in murder charges in Rhode Island, Carpio is an American criminal who committed a heinous act in 2005 by killing Providence Police Detective Sergeant James L. Allen at a Providence Police Station. At the time, Carpio was being questioned at the Providence Police Headquarters alongside another detective regarding an incident involving an 85-year-old woman named Madeline Gotter. According to police reports, Carpio seized the officer's gun while the second detective briefly left the locked interview room. As officers rushed to respond, they heard Detective Allen's desperate plea for help, but Carpio shot him and made a daring escape by jumping from the third floor. However, the drama did not end there. Due to the risky jump and his resistance during the arrest, Carpio sustained injuries. When the time for his sentencing arrived, Carpio appeared in court wearing a mask designed to prevent him from spitting at or biting others. His face was red, bruised, and swollen, leading to outcries from his family members who accused the police of brutality. Carpio's family believed that the mask was intended to conceal the alleged revenge beating inflicted on him behind closed doors. In the courtroom, his family is shocked to see his disfigured face. Carpio's aunt even went on live TV to decry what she termed police brutality, arguing that Carpio was mentally ill and in need of help, not violence. Gross police brutality! He was mentally ill and he, and he needed help and we couldn't get him. We tried and tried. And he didn't deserve this. In response, Providence Police Chief Dean M. Esserman contended that Carpio's injuries were primarily due to his leap from the third floor interview room and his resistance during the arrest. Subsequently, the FBI conducted an investigation into the police conduct, concluding that there was no excessive use of force or civil rights violation since the injuries were incident to the arrest, meaning the officers were justified in using necessary force when confronted with resistance. There is no civil rights violation when uh, injuries are um, incident to arrest, meaning if he's fighting the police officers, the officers have the right to use whatever force necessary to subdue the subject. On June 27, 2006, a jury found Carpio guilty of Detective Allen's murder and the stabbing of Madeline Gotter, despite his claim of insanity. Carpio received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Initially, he showed little reaction to his sentence and remained unmoved. However, later, in an apparent effort to appeal to the jury, he expressed remorse for his actions emphasizing the daily burden of guilt he carried. Number 4. Jordan Fuss The 22-year-old in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, faced DUI manslaughter charges for a 2014 accident that killed 6-year-old Santiago Giroldo. His blood alcohol level was 0.21, over double the legal limit when he was driving at speeds exceeding 90 miles per hour on Sterling Road. He collided with another vehicle at Davie Road, resulting in the tragic incident. Red light cameras captured then 19-year-old Fuss in his Infinity sports car flying down Sterling Road with speeds reaching more than 100 miles per hour. The prosecutors sought the maximum penalty for his crime, while the defendant's attorney argued for a reduced sentence, citing the defendant's remorse, which had even led to contemplations of suicide. However, prosecutors pointed out that the defendant had admitted to continued alcohol and marijuana use since the crash. The child's mother and sister were also in the car. They survived. In the courtroom, emotions ran high as the Giroldo family wept while the defense sought a more lenient sentence. Santiago's father took the stand, addressing the defendant directly. May God forgive you, because I can't. A translator telling Fuss his apology wasn't accepted. He didn't just take my son's life, he took mine too. <laughs> Throughout the trial, the defendant, overwhelmed with remorse, could be seen tearfully apologizing to the victim's family. It was a moment of profound sorrow. It's 
so sorry. I wish it was me. He did not deserve it. I did. I would give my life. If it meant bringing him back. The verdict was finally delivered, and the defendant received a 14-year prison sentence. This sentence was in accordance with the lowest permissible prison term under Florida's Criminal Punishment Code, specifically 14.625 years. The defendant continued to cry upon learning his fate. The court imposes the lowest permissible prison sentence allowable by Florida's Criminal Punishment Code, 14.625 years. Guilty of DUI manslaughter, DUI unlawful blood alcohol level with serious bodily injury. Fuss had one last tearful message to loved ones while being fingerprinted. I love you guys so much. I love you. Number five, Jaleel Hoskins. Found out the man accused of killing her daughter will stand trial. We can't get her back. This is Jaleel Hoskins facing murder charges in Michigan for the killing of his girlfriend Latrice Mays in a case fraught with mystery and tragedy. Mays, a mother of five, mysteriously disappeared in March of 2013. Her sudden absence left her family desperate for answers, leading to a nationwide search. Initially, Hoskins vehemently denied any involvement in her murder, declaring, I have nothing to do with the murder. I have nothing to do with the disappearance. However, Hoskins had a change of heart when faced with compelling testimonials and evidence against him. The turning point came when Hoskins' own cousin took the stand, providing chilling insight into the events surrounding Mays' tragic end. She revealed that after a domestic altercation, Mays had confided in her that she planned to report Hoskins for assaulting the father of two of her children. She feared that Hoskins would harm her, a fear tragically realized. One of Hoskins' close friends also testified, sharing Mays' plea for help and the admission that she couldn't carry the burden alone. Intriguingly, police dashcam footage from the day of the murder captured their response to a call made by Latrice in which she accused Hoskins of abusing her. Faced with this mountain of evidence, Hoskins had no choice but to change his plea. He admitted to both the murder of Latrice Mays and tampering with evidence. Hoskins, a habitual criminal offender, had taken Mays' life out of fear that she would report the assault on the father of two of her children to the police. He was initially charged with open murder, carrying a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole. Mays had been coerced by her own fears, worrying that she might not regain custody of her children unless she cooperated with law enforcement regarding the assault against the children's father. As a repeat offender, Hoskins received the maximum life sentence in prison. His reaction in the courtroom was nothing short of explosive, attacking the podium before being restrained by the police. You have 42 days to appeal your remand to the custody of the Department of Corrections for service of this sentence. Thank you. Your Honor. <coughs> Number six, Adrian Dunn. Some anxious moments in court after a convicted killer learns that he will be going to prison for life. Adrian Dunn was convicted of murder for shooting a man in the back during a drug deal. Adrian Dunn, an ex-convict facing murder charges in San Antonio, found himself sentenced for the tragic murder of Rakim Tariq Charles. Police reports indicate that Adrian shot Charles in the back during a drug deal that took place in a parking lot on July 16, 2012. What makes this even more disturbing is that this wasn't Adrian Dunn's first brush with the law. He'd previously been incarcerated twice for firearm possession. Shockingly, just a month prior to the murder, he was involved in yet another shooting. He's been to prison twice for possessing a firearm after this murder. He committed another shooting a month before this murder. And he's shown zero remorse. Adding to the gravity of the situation, Adrian displayed no signs of remorse. Prosecutors strongly urged the jury to impose the maximum sentence. They emphasized Adrian's extensive criminal history and the complete lack of remorse for the murder. Prosecutor Jason Goss, standing alongside the victim's parents, passionately argued for a life sentence, highlighting the need to prevent another family from enduring the same suffering that Charles's family had endured. Goss emphasized the pain Charles's family had gone through and stressed the necessity of a life sentence to ensure justice. If you thought the crimes were already horrendous, Adrian's reaction to his sentencing during the trial was equally astonishing. Throughout the proceedings, he showed no remorse and displayed a concerning lack of concern. 
despite his attorney's plea for a sentence of 35 to 40 years, arguing that it would allow Adrian a chance to rehabilitate in prison and potentially become an asset to the community upon release, the jury deliberated for a mere two hours before delivering a life sentence. As the jury's decision was read aloud, Adrian erupted into a physical altercation with Bexar County Sheriff's deputies who were trying to escort him from the courtroom. His behavior was marred by profanity and disruptive outbursts, eventually leading to his removal from the court. Adrian's case could be aptly described as a drug-related incident gone terribly awry.